The quiet days weren't always Charles's favorite times on the job as a freelance private investigator. He usually likes to get as many unfortunate children out of disgusting and cruel homes as much as possible, away from families who would make their kids' lives a living torment. But as the day drew closer to dawn, he picked up a call from his employer, a nice old lady who he was checking up on due to the rough neighborhood she lived in, who said that there was yelling at the Knudsen residence. He picked up speed toward the one-story excuse for a house, which looked as run down as a drug lord's den. Charlie crept inside the house as he heard yelling down in the basement. It's always the basement, isn't it? Charlie thought to himself. Why can't it be the living room, or better yet, the front lawn? He drew his pistol from his suit pocket. He liked keeping his gun out of sight, and called out to the family. Hello? This is the police. Come out with your hands up. Then, he found a horrific sight. Three kids locked in cages who looked like they haven't been bathed in weeks, not being able to move a muscle. He then saw a man in a lab coat with a gun holding a woman who Charlie assumed was his wife, or rather, ex-wife. Charlie points the gun at him instinctively. Hey, drop the gun now and let her go. The man, who looked like he didn't sleep for a couple of days, was shaking as he sputtered the words from his mouth. No, I can't. Charlie looked at him with disbelief. Come on, man. Just drop the gun and hand her over to me, all right? You look a bit buzzed. Maybe I can call someone to come look at you. Charlie was always the type to distract someone so he can get what he wanted, which in this case was to get the gun out of his hand. No, I'm fine. I swear. Just leave, okay? For your sake. He pointed the gun at Charlie. Now. Charlie's breathing spiked as he looked down the man's gun barrel. Okay, okay. I can see you're upset. Would you mind telling me your name and about what's going on? It's Eric. Charlie was pleased at the progress. Okay, Eric. What's going on here that made you want to hurt your family? I can't tell you. You won't believe me. Eric wasn't going to last long. He was on the verge of a mental breakdown. Trust me. I believe every word. I swear. Eric paused and began to speak. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I was on a hike in the woods when I heard someone yelling for help. I started to run towards his screaming as it got louder and louder. Pretty stupid of me, wasn't it? Anyways, that's when I saw him. No, not him. It. Charlie was wasting time. He needs to act fast. Look for a non-lethal way to subdue him. A leg. Or in the hand. Anything. Then what? Charlie questioned. It wore a suit like you, but it wasn't human. It looked like one, but it was way too tall to be one. It had to be over eight feet tall. It had a little girl in its arms with her torso all mangled like an animal attacked her. It saw me, and it pelted a girl in a tree and started to make this awful noise, like a cicada screeching. He finished the story, saying he was blacked out and he had been having these panic attacks. It needs them, Eric said, pointing the gun to the locked up kids. Charlie wasn't paying attention, but nodded at every sentence like he was. He figured the best thing to do was to shoot the hand holding the gun. Makes sense, right? But the woman's shoulder would be scathed, so he had to tend to those injuries until the paramedics came. With that figured out, he took the shot, and the man screeched as he fell to the floor, holding his hand and dropping the gun. The woman, surprisingly, wasn't hurt as bad as he thought, just needed a couple stitches. Charlie cuffed a man, but after he did, Eric had the most coincidental seizure, as if the cuffs triggered it. The last words he spoke were, Don't look into its face. The last image he saw was, The being he refused to call human, standing on the other side of the basement, looking at his next prey. Shocked at his death, he hurriedly got the wife out of the basement and called the paramedics for the children. After they were taken to the hospital, Charlie senses that he shouldn't have left them, but he pushed the thought out of his mind, as if he was just paranoid. He left the residence with a mix of satisfaction and dread, since he'd never really seen anyone die in such a way, but he also felt watched, not by the wife or children, but by something else as if the tale Eric had spun up had some merit to it, some truth. Little did he know that it was in fact a reality, that the being was watching him, waiting for the time to strike. After the incident, Charlie felt off while driving home, almost lightheaded. He made it home to his family, which consisted of his wife Elizabeth and his 10-year-old daughter, Sarah. Entering the house, he greeted his family. Hey guys, 
Hopefully you guys had a great time, because I had one of the most bizarre experiences today. Liz looked up at her husband. What happened? It's not like you to be stressed after work, she said, pretty concerned. Well, it wasn't as simple as getting kids out of a messed up family. This? This was different. But I'm pretty tired and not really in the mood for any conversations. Charlie walked upstairs and disappeared for the night. In the coming weeks since the incident, Charlie started acting strange, less like his optimistic self and more dangerous. He started lashing out at Liz and Sarah for the tiniest problems and being mute for over an hour. He wasn't like this. He was a loving father who had his daughter by a short but weak leash. If anyone wanted to hurt her, he would hurt them back. He stopped doing that, and instead of fighting back, he just watched. He stopped talking to Liz and started taking long walks late at night and stand on people's lawns without being seen. One time, Liz wanted to take Charlie to a therapist, thinking he has some sort of PTSD. He started to break down and telling her that she shouldn't be so protective of him and that he can handle it on his own. The symptoms started to escalate. Many seizures, panic attacks, bloody noses that would take hours to clear up, hearing and seeing things that weren't there, and sleep paralysis that would drive him to wake up and attack the nearest thing around him, which was his wife most of the time. It's a miracle she even coped with him. They were made for each other. He lashed out one time at Liz for my asking too many questions. Stop, 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 he screamed as he smacked his head, trying to distract himself from her constant questioning. Why can't she just leave me alone? After a couple of weeks of living as a short fuse, he finally came to his senses and left a note in the kitchen, saying that he was going to go away for a while, that he was too dangerous to be around. He also stated that he would be back in a couple of days. What they didn't realize was, he lied. He wasn't coming back. He was staying in a cabin out in the woods for as long as possible, even if it meant dying there. Charlie didn't know how long it took him to drive to the cabin. He zoned out a lot, thinking of his family, thinking of how he might have disappointed them, but he shook the thought out of his mind and focused on the task at hand. He parked his car in front of the old house, a one-story, broken-down wooden cabin in the middle of a sea of giant trees. He sped walked to the door and went inside. He looked around to make sure no one was following him. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Calm down. Calm down. He summed himself as he locked the door. It's only going to be a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks! He slammed his fist against the table that sat in front of the bed, laying out a frustrated growl. He laid on the bed, looking at the ceiling as he pieced together a fantasy in his head. He thought of waking up the next morning feeling fine and driving back home to see his family, not having to worry about the monster watching his every move. But that was never coming true. This monster, this thing, was persistent. He watched, he listened, and kept his grip tight around Charlie. Charlie was his play toy, used to satisfy his hunger. Charlie then saw him, the thing that tortured him for weeks now. He started to become furious, angry. What the hell are you? He stood up against the window and screamed at the thing against the back wall of the house, hiding in the shadows. The only answer he got was from a couple vibrations and a loud screech in his ear. Charlie fell on the floor, ears bleeding as he looked up at him. Just tell me, please. Words flashed in his mind. Mousimus, the tall man, Dur Ritter, the man in the fields, and Slenderman. Charlie looked up and spoke. Slenderman? Charlie then went out like a light, only waking up in the middle of the night in his bed, not being able to move. He knew what was happening. He saw the shadowy form of him moving closer to the bed on the right side. Each step he would make would make the wood creak, loud, thud, thud, thud. Charlie then heard something he didn't hear before, the sound of children crying. As he stood over the bed, watching him, the cries of the children grew more disturbing, causing Charlie's whole body to sweat. He woke up, but he couldn't see. He could hear. But most importantly, he couldn't breathe. He started frantically grabbing at his face with a thin layer of skin that became his new face and tried to rip it off. Scratching and clawing at it didn't work as he started to scream, but they were muffled against a constricting mass. From outside, it was a skin-colored, featureless blank that kept him from breathing. He started shaking as he started slipping away. After a while, he let out a guttural scream as he let out his last breath. The last thought that Charlie had 
was of his daughter. Thanks for joining us around the campfire. If you enjoyed the story, subscribe below. Also, hit that notification bell to be notified of our new stories as they are posted. If you have a story you'd like to share for narration, submit it via email, and you may be hearing your story next. Our email address is in the description box below. Thank you, and good night.